Hello and welcome to another video. I'm Exters and I'd like to today go over the drop table, specifically the one that I made for Majora's Mask, but the techniques that I'd like to teach in this video will also apply to the Ocarina of Time drop tables. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the Majora's Mask drop table that I put together a couple months back at the time of making this video. Uh, this table basically explains uh, the drops that can happen in-game for each enemy. It has uh, each of the enemies listed and which table they use. So you see 9 here corresponds to the 9 up here. And then I can see, okay, there's a 9 sixteenths chance of getting a blue rupee times 3, right? And so on. Uh, over in this corner here, we have some small tables for two special kinds of drops. These bright pink ones and these more purple ones. Uh, the bright pink ones are what are called mask drops, and they're drops that change depending on your mask. And the purple ones were present in Ocarina of Time as well. They're called flex drops, and they change depending on basically how much ammo you have or how much health you have in-game at the moment. So what I'd like to do today is go over how these tables were put together, uh, how exactly you could do it yourself if you were interested in replicating this table, and also how you can go about testing a few specific things, particularly the variable enemies or enemies that uh, enemies and items in the game like pots and ice spikes uh, that they change depending on each enemy. They're actually individually set. So to begin with, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pop down here to the bottom where it says about the data. Let me go ahead and zoom in so it's easier to read that. It says that the data for the chart was collected using the Project 64 emulator. I'm going to be using uh, a version of the emulator called Project 64D. Uh, that will include um, that will include a debugger that's necessary to do this, and I'll put that in the below in the links. But I expect that the version of Project, the actual like official version of Project 64 will be including this debugger shortly. I know that their test builds are already including it, but I'll link to it anyway. Uh, hopefully in a few months, though, you won't even need to download a special version of Project 64. So going over it, uh, the charts uh, reflect values and in memory inside of the game for the Japanese 1.0 version. This is important in Ocarina of Time. It didn't actually matter which version you use. In my case, I use version 1.2, or actually the language didn't matter. The version did matter. Uh, but in Majora's Mask, let me go back to the Majora's Mask one, it actually did matter that you use the Japanese 1.0 version because these memory addresses that I list here are different from version to version and from language to language because Majora's Mask isn't just a quick bit flip to decide which language it is. Um, so the tables for these charts up at the top, those tables are located, there's 17 of them, each of them is 16 bytes in size, don't worry if you're not a programmer, this video is going to be a little bit technical, but it's not going to require that you have any serious, serious knowledge of, you know, low-level editing, I personally don't, so... Uh, the idea is that I want this to be, a, you know, something that's accessible to people that are interested in figuring this stuff out, but aren't necessarily uh, low-level developers. So, the next 17 tables, so there's 17 tables that have specifically what are the items, and then there's 17 more tables right after that that decide how many of each item drop. So, for example, in the case of the hearts one right here, where each of them drops three hearts, the first table would simply say that there's 16 chances of a heart, right? Out of all 16, all of them would say that it's a heart drop. And then there would be a corresponding table in the next 17 tables that would have threes for everything to say that all of them should drop three hearts. And this is true also of the, uh, the triple blue rupee drops. So uh, along with that, probably the key to all this is there's a break point, which is basically... What you do is you go through the game's code and you say when the when the game runs this section of code or like this function in the game, pause the game. That way I can check what's happening with that function. What kind of information uh, was passed to that function and what's the current state of the game when that function gets called. So we're going to set a breakpoint on the function that drops items. And so what that'll do is when we cut grass or when we kill an enemy... 
if that enemy uses the item drop functionality for the game, the random drop tables and everything, it will call this function and that will pause the game so that we can look at this thing right here, this register, uh, let me zoom back in, this register A3. We're going to look at that and that actually tells us what drop table is going to be used for this drop. And so that's how I'm able to figure out which enemies use which tables and how you can, with these variable enemies, go ahead and kill any specific enemy in the game and figure out, okay, which table does that guy use? So let me go ahead and get into this. Let me switch over to a way that we can browse. So I've got my Project 64 emulator open right here. You can see there's a debugger option. You have to turn that on in settings. You'll have to uncheck this hide advanced settings. And then under the config for the game, actually my bad, it's back in advanced. So after you've unchecked hide advanced settings, click advanced. You have to enable debugger and always use interpreter core. Again, this is a special version of Project 64 that I'm using at the moment. You can do this with Nemu as well. The steps are very similar uh, and it's an older emulator that's more supported, but or that I guess just isn't shifting. It's more stable, I should say. But with Project 64 continuing to be updated, this debugger, I think, will become in the normal version of it. Again, I will link to the version that I am using in case you want to hop right on it right now. So uh, when you download that version, you simply put it in your Project 64 folder and it just works. Uh, you also have to make sure you mark it as interpreter and then you'd restart your emulator. So what I'm going to do is you want to open up the memory. You want to go ahead and view it. So there's my memory viewer. And then you want to have, this is the feature that actually, so you can view memory in, in Project 64 already. The thing that you can't do is this RSP commands section. Oh, whoops. That's not the one I want. It's the breakpoint. That's it. You just go to debugger breakpoint. In the case of Nemo, it's just called commands and memory. So it's pretty similar. Uh, so what we want to do then is use those values that were listed in that table. So if I hop back there, let's see, that's 801A8E04, okay? And the other one is this function location. So I've got those written down. I'm going to go ahead and hop back in. So first of all, this is the commands one. This is where I put in the function value. So in this case, let me just copy and paste that in. Bam, and here we are. So this is the function, this part of the top. Notice that it has the same address that I just typed in. So I'm going to place a breakpoint on it by right-clicking and saying toggle breakpoint. So there we go. Now when that function is called, the game will pause so that I can figure out what's going on in that exact minute, in that exact instance. So now let's go ahead and find the drop tables. So I'm going to go down to my address for memory, and here we are. There's the drop tables. I just pasted that value in right there. Um, this is V address has to be checked. Uh, other ones don't have other emulators with debuggers don't have this setting, but it's the uh, same exact thing. You put in that value, put you right where you want to be. So let's talk about what this stuff means. I'm going to go ahead and hop into my browser again, and let's focus on this spreadsheet that I created when I was doing this project. If I hop over to the raw drop tables, this is a copy of what you see in memory. See so yeah, that's 0, 0, 0, 0001. I can bring up um, that memory table again. Actually, let me hop back over to there. I can bring up that memory table and you can see 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001. This is a copy paste right out of here, these first 16 tables or 17 tables. And then we have the multiplier tables to right here. See how these threes are there? Again, if I hop back to my memory, I can scroll down and see there are my threes right here. So you can see it's right below the tables that tell it which items. Now, the next question that you might have, uh, let me go ahead and go back to that address. I want 14. Okay. I think I've got the wrong thing now. Let's make sure that we're looking at the right section. Okay, here we go. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, not the raw drop tables. Okay, this is what I want. 
So let me go ahead and hop back to that. In my memory. Oh, get rid of that 0x in the front. There we go. So now we're back where we want. The next question will then be, okay, well, how do I know what that 00, zero means? 0001 zero, zero, FF, right? Well, first off, I should say um, the FFs mean don't create anything. So if the so each of these numbers, each of these two groupings of numbers actually has a corresponding value, and that value decides which item will be dropped. And each of these is a 1 16th chance, right? So notice how there are four sets of four. So there's 16 of them. Each one represents a 1 16th chance of being chosen by the drop function. So in this case, the FFs represent drop nothing. If an FF is hit, you drop nothing, right? Now, what I have in my spreadsheet is these drop table types. I went through and I found what each of these drops is. So zero, zero is a green rupee, right? FF is nothing right there. Uh, there are some funny ones that you actually never see in game. Uh, for example, this invisible one that I'm not sure exactly what it means. There's a bomb drop that actually doesn't increase your bomb count at all. And, you know, various things like that. There's one that has a heart container with no visuals. This one's just literally a piece of heart that drops if you switch them to that. And I'll show that in a little bit. So first off, let me just go ahead and show then how we would test in-game values. So let me hop in-game. And we'll go ahead and start cutting some stuff. So... Okay, I'm going to switch to being Link. Oh! It hit the uh, function. Oh, it's because that bomb shoe blew up. That real bomb shoe called the drop functionality, but I want to show it with the bushes because it's a little more obvious if we do that. Okay, this is the closest one. So the chews are an interesting one in that... That was a little harder than it should have been. The chews are an interesting one in that they don't have anything. Let me cut this bush. Okay, let's go ahead and hop back so we can get a big view of that memory editor. So now it has paused, we hit our break point, and I look at the A3 and I see a 0000, zero, 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 zero there, okay? Or sorry, A3, yeah. Um, I see nothing but zeros there, okay? What that tells me is that these bushes use the zero drop table. So let me go ahead and hop back to that. The zero drop table looks like this, okay? So that's useful to know that bushes are going to use that. I can go ahead and hop back in game. And if I open up my breakpoint and go ahead and continue, you hit that go button. Let me chop another bush just to show that off. You can see right here, I have to hit the go button. Let me pop back in and show this. I have to hit this go button in order to continue the game. So go. And you can see I hit two bushes there, so it pops twice. Okay. So that's a little bit interesting. How about this? Now we want to talk about how we can, let's say, get all of it to drop the exact same thing. So let me zoom over to a new set of bushes here. Again, shoes don't have a drop, so killing him won't cause the drop function to go off. Okay, so what I can do, actually is I can hop into my memory editor right here. And since I know that they use the zero table, conveniently enough, this, uh, this second digit right here generally tells you which table it is. Note that it is in hex, so where my table is labeled 11, this will be A, and that goes up to F, which is the equivalent of 15 in decimal. If you're somebody that's not a big fan of hex, you can go ahead and pop open your editor, and, uh, and if you're in Windows, switch it to programmer mode, you can click hex, and you can type, let's say, B, and it'll tell you decimal, that's an 11, right? And you can do the same thing to reverse it. I could say, like, 15, and it tells me hex, that's an F. So if you're not one that really wants to be doing that, um, you know, jugg joggling back, juggling back and forth between hex and decimal, then you can go ahead and use the calculator for Windows. So let me hop back in here. 
And now what I'm going to do is because I know that these all use the zero table, I'm going to pop back here. Let's say I want to make all of them drop bombs. So I'm going to look at my drop table types and I know that the zero four is a bomb drop. So let me go ahead and pop back in here. And I'm going to change all of these to be fours. Okay. So if drop table table zero is called, or in this, you know, I think I labeled it drop table one in my chart. Now it will always give a bomb drop. A hundred percent chance of giving a bomb drop. There's actually no table like this in the game, but we just customized and made the table that way. So let me show that off. Oh, it paused. Okay, it's calling table zero and bombs. Nothing but bombs, right? Let me remove that drop or that break point so we can get a nice look at how that looks. Okay. This will actually come out nothing but bombs. And so there you go. So that's how I went about testing things like the flex drop and the max mask drop. So let me go ahead and move over to another area. Okay. Kill this chew. So now, popping back in. Let's say I wanted to test flex drops. I'm interested in how flex drops work. So if I hop back over to my table, I can see that flex drops, right, are pretty rare. They're not really anywhere. So that's difficult to test. I want to see uh, what do flex drops look like? How do they, um, how does changing the situation change it? Now I have given the information as to what they do right here. And if we read this, um, I can see, okay, the first check is if there's one heart or less, give a fairy. Okay, so that's interesting because getting fairies is pretty rare. So if I can force fairies, then that proves that, right? And then it says, okay, but if you're not one heart or less, then it'll give hearts times three. If you have more than one and up to three hearts, it'll give a single heart. If you have more than three and up to five hearts, and if you have empty magic, it'll give you a large magic jar, right? It only gives whichever's the first one going down this table, right? And so you have to have less than six arrows to get 30, or less than six arrows to get 30 arrow drops, less than six bombs to get bomb drops, less than 11 rupees will give you a red rupee drop. And if you don't have any of these conditions, then a flex drop will turn into nothing, okay? So let me hop over then to my table again. So what we're interested in is the flex drop. We can see that's a value of 12. So if I take that, flex drop is a value of 12. So I hop back into my game. Actually, let me go ahead and open up my memory editor. Let's change all these to 12 now. So these will all become flex drops. And this way we can test flex drop behavior with a 100% chance of getting a flex drop rather than having to deal with only having, say, a a one in 16 chance of getting a flex drop, which is the most that any drop has. Okay. So if I switch back to being in game, I can cut this. Let's see. They're dropping nothing because I don't have any of those requirements missing, but let's say I go ahead and damage myself. I'll go ahead and wait for this chew to do his work I'm gonna have to edit this out of the video okay so he's got me down to three hearts here let me check this out. If I cut that bush, what happens? It drops three hearts, just as was shown in that table. Okay. Let's say he gets me down to... Let's say he gets me down to one heart or less. Let's let him do that. Oh, come on. Okay, here we go. One heart or less, fairy drop. Oh. Fairy drops. Nothing but fairy drops because it's a 100% chance of doing a flex drop because I modified it. Now, if I kill him, 
pick up that heart. Let's run over. We'll chop another one. Okay, I just got three hearts out of that. So now I'm up to four hearts. It should only drop a single heart now. Perfect, got that. And now it'll go back to dropping nothing. Perfect. So that shows us that flex drops work pretty much how we predicted. I'm not going to show off arrows and bombs, but just trust me on this, I've tested it. Okay, so how about a mask drop? Let's go ahead and hop back into here. A mask drop is this 10, right? One zero, in which case that's actually a 16, right? Because zero F is 15, but it's one zero in hex and that's what our editor uses. So we can see for link, it should give us arrows 10, green rupee is a Deku scrub, small magic jar is a Goron, as a Zor, it should give a heart. If you're a fierce deity, it should give you a green rupee. So let's modify all of these to be mask drops, to force a mask drop whenever we cut grass in terminal of field here. Okay, perfect. Let's hop back in game. Okay, I'm linked, so this should always be arrows now. There we go. Ten arrows. Ten arrows. Let's switch to Deku Scrub. Nope, oh, green rupee. Green rupee, as expected. Let's switch to Goron. Now it's small magic jars. Small magic jars, just as expected. So there you have it. That's mask drops and that's flex drops. Let's go ahead and talk about variable drops. I'm going to work my way over to Snowhead so I can show off, uh, from what I hear, one of the more notorious flex drops in the game. Or not flex drops, the one of the more notorious variable enemy drops. Okay. Okay. So these icicles have drop tables, right? So if I hop back over to my commands table, right? I hop back over here. I'm going to go ahead and re-add that breakpoint. That way we can figure out what actually is going on. So, okay. So if I hop back over to my breakpoints, I can see in the A3, there's a one over here. Okay. So one zero, one zero, zero. I will say that it's a little funny. You have to remember that basically this these two are the actual value. So this is a 10. This would be drop table 10, right? So let's go ahead and hit go. Continue. Let me push this. Like I said, I wanted to show off one of the more infamous ones. Okay. We can see there's the Wolfos dying. If I hop back over here, there's a 60. And the Wolfos uses drop table six. You can see him, there he is right there, right? And so we know that he tends to drop hearts, although he has a very small chance of dropping a flex drop. So going back to my game, I'm gonna hit go and continue there. There we go. Dropped hearts, as one would expect. Okay, so these two right here. These have variable drops. Um, as in, they use a drop table, but each icicle, each ice spike throughout the game, is actually assigned by the developers which table they're going to use. So this spike right here... Well, that one just fell. But this spike right here, if I look, it uses an A3, B0. Okay, so if we remember... B, we're going to go ahead and do this just to be lazy. If we do B, that says it's a decimal of 11. And if I hop over, 11 means that this one has a 50, a little more than 50% chance of dropping bombs. So let's see if it gives us that. Okay. Let's go ahead and see if it gives us that. Nope. Oh, but never mind. There's the bomb drop. Perfect. And this one right here, let's hit it. And what value are we seeing here in the A3? That's an A0 right there. So if we go ahead and pop back over and look, an A0, A is a 10, right? So we can look and it should be arrows. There is a 2 16 chance of 30 arrows, a 10 16 chance of 10 arrows, but it could end up being a large or small magic jar if we just get unlucky 
depending on whether we want them, I guess it might be lucky. So let's see. We got arrows uh, as expected. So there you have it. That's how you can test the variable enemies. There are quite a few of them. If we go ahead and look back there, I can show off uh, which enemies are variable. Let's see. So the skullfish actually are variable. The ones that are in the bay, from what I've seen, don't drop anything. But uh, the ones in all of the temples have specific drops, and they vary from skullfish to skullfish. The black and white bows usually drop nothing, but I've seen in some areas they actually do have drop tables. Pots sometimes use drop tables. Other times they uh, are fixed, and so they drop the same thing every time. Same thing with ice spikes and grass patches like this, right? Sometimes they can use drop tables. Um, I think the grass patches always use drop tables. So let me hop back over into this spreadsheet, which I'll be linking below. I actually made a list of all of the in-game actors, right? So here's all of the pots that use, um, let's see. So I say right here, last byte on the variable. So the last byte is essentially the last letter should be the drop table. So I can see which drop table uh, each of these pots should be using throughout the game. I have, you know, what room they're in, and you'll have to figure this out. Hopefully you understand the in-game variables enough to find this information. I did the same thing for the grasses, as grass, grass clusters and rocks in the game. Um, I also made a table for what were called fixed drop actors. Uh, basically, these are all the actors that you hit them and they only drop like one thing, right? They're always going to drop that same thing. So I made a list of them just so that you can look at the actor variable right here because that can be useful coupled with the drop table types to figure out what each of these enemies should be dropping, right? And so speaking of this, so let's look at these icicles. In Snowhead Temple, here's the two icicles at the entrance, right? Room ID, it says entrance, right? And you can see there's, I have first two bytes, the variable should be the drop table. Right, with FF being nothing, and if there's a 0, 1 on the end, it means it's a uh, stalactite. So it'll be on the ceiling and it doesn't have a drop. So 0A and 0B, just like we saw when we tested them, right? The other thing that you can do, and I think that I, I hope that many streamers and many uh, other runners that are interested in this kind of stuff get into this, is you can use Scene Navi to do this. Let me go ahead and hop into Scene Navi to show this off. So I'm in this front room with Scene Navi. I've switched into movable objects mode. You can just click this to, to move those around, but I'm going to switch back to movable objects mode. And I can click these two stalactites and see their variable. There we go. There's the B variable, just like we thought it would have. And there's the A variable, implying that it should be the arrow drop, right? And this saying that it should be the bomb drop, right? And so that's an easy way that you can look up specific pots. Now, I tried to go through, if we hop back to my browser, I tried to go through the pots and explain last by on the variable should be the drop table. Grass, I tried to explain what you should look for, but I didn't go through it extensively. There might be some exceptions. You might need to do some testing to figure out what these actually mean, these variables. But essentially, the actor variable that's assigned by the game creators is how these enemies decide which table to use. And on these fixed ones the variable decides what that drop should always be, and it's probably referencing right here, this table, right? It's probably referencing one of these to say which one to use. And so there you have it. That's pretty much how you can test out individual actors in the game, see what they should drop. Hopefully you guys got something out of this video. I'm hoping that uh, people will be able to use it, that they wouldn't be reliant on me, and also that you can get more use out of this table that I made, because... I think it's a very useful resource. I think that flex drops and mask drops are probably the most uh, underappreciated thing in the game um, as far as these drops are concerned. I think that a lot of speedrunners would benefit from learning what these mask drops are, learning how the flex drops work. That way they can take advantage of them during runs on the fly because your situation in the game will vary uh, as you're going through it, and it might be prudent to switch masks before you start cutting bushes if you're trying to get arrows, for example, right? Things like that. I've tried to include some of the common ones, like the, the rolling snowballs and various grass patches in the table, but not everything's included, so hopefully this video helps you figure out stuff for yourself. 
so you can go around and test. And maybe I'll find you might be able to find that I didn't do everything perfect. Majora's Mask was a far more complex game than Ocarina of Time as far as the drop tables were concerned. So I would love to be corrected, and I'm happy to update this table. Um, let me know if you uh, have any questions about this. I'm going to be including all the links to the information that we looked at here uh, in the in the description below. And thanks for watching. Really appreciate your time.